Welcome, it's Tuesday the 31st of March. Now in this video I wanted to talk about a, a paper published in New England Journal of Medicine that shows the spread of the COVID-19 within a, a care facility, which I've always been worried about. And of course it's always nice to get information directly from medical journals. Now what this showed is that from one index case, from just one index case, in a care facility of 130 people, that there was 101 of those infected and that 35 people died. And from the one index case, 167 other people were infected. That was 101, 101 patients or residents, 50 staff and 16 visitors. So the bottom line of this video is, if you don't want to watch it all, is that care facilities are very much at risk very much at risk and there's a very high case fatality rate among the residents. Fortunately in this study, as of the end of the study, there was no fatalities in the staff which is uh, quite a relief. But it did show that the residents are at very high risk but as well as the residents being at risk there is the potential for these care facilities to become epicentres of new spreading infection as we saw in this case with 167 people epidemiologically linked to that one index case. Now, if you want to skip this video now, that's fine. If you want the details, let's uh, give you some here. So this was in uh, King County, which is just north of Seattle, I think, Washington State. And it's looking at the risks, the age, the comorbidities, and the risk to healthcare workers and how healthcare workers can spread the infection as well. And it involves the Center for Disease Control, and they did good contact tracing, quarantining, Isolation of confirmed cases, quarantining of suspected contacts. And as a consequence, they greatly enhance the infection control. So a lot of things in this microcosm, really, that we need to be able to be doing on an international scale as part of our control measures against this pandemic. So quite a lot to learn from this paper, really. And of course, I'll post the link so you can examine the paper for, your, for yourself at leisure. Now the results with a 130 bed facility and uh, we think it was full, so 130 patients, 170 staff going in and out full time, part time, making 300 people all together. And of this 300, there was 167 confirmed cases. So well over 50% of the people that could be infected were infected. And of the 130, 101 of the residents were infected. So we see a very high infection rate amongst the residents of this care facility. But as well, 50 of the 170 care providers or care personnel were also infected and 16 visitors were also infected. Only 13% of the residents, 17 of the residents were not infected of those that were tested. So we see the vast majority of the residents were infected. Now the first thing here is quite interesting uh, seven of the residents were asymptomatic and this is probably roughly what we would uh, expect so this means 94 of the residents had symptoms so what we see is when older people are infected they're more likely to get symptomatic disease if this had been a group of 130 children we would have expected many more to be asymptomatic but in the older people the vast majority were symptomatic they had symptoms so 96 is it of the 101 so m most of them anyway had symptoms N 94 of them had symptoms so um, only 7% asymptomatic roughly what we would expect in this older age group now the hospitalization rates were interesting and concerning um, the residents <clears throat> their median age was 83 so 54% of those were hospitalized and the case fatality rate was 34% so 34% of the residents died. Very high case fatality rate, and that's just up to the end of the study. Now the staff, the median age was 43.5, but 50% of those had to be treated in hospital. Now I don't know quite what the criteria were, but this is concerning. And it may be that staff sometimes get more severe disease because they get a higher exposure dose, they get a higher inoculation dose of the virus. So if they've been working with several infected people throughout a shift, 
then they could have had very large numbers of the virus in their respiratory tract, which might have mean the disease became established more quickly. But thankfully, the case fatality rate in the staff was zero at the end of the study, so that was good. So what we're seeing is, in the median age 83 with comorbidities, 34% case fatality rate. In younger, fitter working people, median age 43, thankfully, even though some people were quite poorly, none of them died. So again, this is consistent with what we've been expecting to see. Always nice to have it confirmed from the medical journals, though. Now, the visitors, their median age was 62. 6% uh, of those needed hospitalised, but the case fatality rate there was quite high. So in the 60 to 70 year old age group in China, the case fatality rate was quite a bit lower than that. It turned out to be about 3.6, I believe. So relatively high case fatality rate there amongst the, uh, the visitors. Now, the comorbidities are interesting. These are the so th th these are the comorbidities diagnosed in the patients who were diagnosed positive with the virus. So these patients were all diagnosed positive with the virus. And we see that many of them were hypertensive, which is a known risk factor. A lot had heart disease, renal disease, diabetes mellitus, some of whom were on insulin, mostly for type 2 diabetes, but some were on insulin. Lung disease, obesity, cancer, immunodeficiency and liver disease. So remember, these are the comorbidities present in the people that were infected and their median age was 83 years. So the combination of these comorbidities and the increasing age gave a case fatality of 34%. So a frighteningly high case fatality rate there and not inconsistent with what we've been seeing anecdotally from um, Italy and Spain and France, where there's been a tragically high death rate within care facilities amongst the, the residents. And also concerning, as of 18th of March, when this study was uh, put in for publication, uh, 30 care facilities with at least one confirmed case of COVID-19 have been identified just in King County. So Washington State as a whole, obviously many more. The whole states, the United States, many more. And obviously globally, many more. So what were the, the conclusions from this? <clears throat> the conclusions we need that we need to be very proactive in protecting these facilities. And indeed, uh, during the course of this study, the... Uh, the visiting was stopped to these facilities and um, I hope personal protective equipment was increased and staff training was increased. So we need proactive steps because not only are the residents in danger, but because so many people were infected as a result of one infected resident, this became a mini epicentre for spread out into the local community to some extent through the workers and the visitors. Um, now, one issue that was identified was before it was clear this patient was known to have COVID-19, that staff with minimal symptoms were working and potentially infected patients. And indeed, we can assume that some of the staff were asymptomatic spreaders as well. So this shows the importance of having a high index of suspicion. Now, they didn't know that there was so much COVID-19 around in the community when this was done. Now we do. We have to have this high index of suspicion and isolate cases and their quarantine their contacts. And it just shows the importance of the infection control measures and personal protective equipment as well. These basic things cannot be overemphasised. The hand washing, the changing clothes, the wearing of eye and mask facilities with infected patients, eye protection and mask protection using gloves, all the protective measures that are so important. Now, the index case, <clears throat> in this case, um, I'll show you a timeline in a minute, but they only became infected on the 19th of February. The, no, no, they were infected before that, two to 14 days before that. So they became symptomatic on the 19th of February. And the individual concerned had no known travel or contacts with person known to have COVID-19. So what this indicates to me is that there was already community spread in Washington state on the 19th of February because this patient presumably got it from a visitor or got it from a member of staff.
As you would expect, the uh, the CTs of the lungs showed uh, bilateral pulmonary infiltrates. I'm not going to show you those now. I've shown you those many times in the past. Um, basically, it means there was fluid collecting in both lungs. Both lungs were infected and fluid was collecting in these air sacs, stopping the oxygen getting in and the carbon dioxide getting out. They were diagnosed in the usual way with nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal swabs. So nasal pharyngeal is the back of the nose. Not very nice, but you get something stuck in the back of your nose. Oropharyngeal, the very back of the mouth, swabs. And sputum in some cases, and it was tested for severe acute respiratory syndrome. Coronavirus type 2, which of course causes the COVID-19 disease. And the first test came out on the 28th of February positive. And the index patient died on the 2nd of March, unfortunately. But I've done a bit of a timeline here because I find these remarkably useful. So what we have here is day one is when the patient first became symptomatic on the 19th of February. So the patient became symptomatic with, um, as you would expect, cough, fever and shortness of breath. So that was day one. Then days one to five after the patient first became symptomatic, that's the 19th to the 24th of February, they were given additional oxygen. But then on day five, this patient was admitted to hospital. The temperature was found to be 36.9, which is um, just over 103 degrees Fahrenheit. So quite a high fever there, quite a high fever. Tachycardia is fast heart rate. Tachypnea is fast breathing. And I've gone with American spellings here because it's an American paper. Hypoxemia is lack of oxygen in the blood and the oxygen saturations were uh, 93%. So the oxygen saturations were, were fairly low and we can just check my saturations here by way of comparison. So my saturations at the moment are... <coughs> 99%. My heart rate is currently 84 in this stressful situation of making a video. So the oxygen saturations were well below normal. So my heart rate is now 78, oxygen saturation is 98. Quite, quite normal, quite normal. Um, but uh, this patient had 83% uh, saturations, very low. Now day six was the 25th of February. They had hypoxemia, low levels of oxygen in the blood. They were intubated. That means they had this breathing tube put down into their, to their lungs for ventilation and they were diagnosed with type 1 respiratory failure. Type 1 respiratory failure is basically acute respiratory failure with low levels of oxygen in the blood, but with normal or low levels of carbon dioxide in the blood. They were diagnosed positive on the 28th of February. Now, that's day 9. Day 9. So this means they had symptoms on day 1 and were still positive, testing positive on day 9. Now, in the UK, we've been telling infected patients to isolate themselves for seven to eight days. But this patient was still positive, therefore presumably infectious with the virus on day nine. So that's quite interesting. So if someone does present with symptoms on day one, it looks like the advice to self-isolate for seven days might be a little bit conservative. It looks like nine or even more days might be prudent given this patient from what you can gather from this paper was still positive on day nine and the patient sadly died on on day uh, 15 but by day 31 that's the uh, 18th of march uh, there'd been 167 linked cases just from this one index case and there'd been 35 deaths just from this one index case so it just shows the importance of recognizing this early so i just wanted to bring you that because it's uh, directly from the medical literature we want to go from the medical literature as much as we can quite a lot to learn there it's showing that one index case can infect over 100 other people and result in potentially tens of deaths if we don't identify and isolate that index case at an early stage. This shows the importance of testing. It shows the importance of having a high index of suspicion. It shows the potential for spread in institutions such as care facilities and indeed probably in prisons and other institutions 
and the infection can then spread from those outwards as they form a mini epicenter as well as devastating the people that live in there and resulting in high case fatality rates especially if there's comorbidities and especially if people are in the older age groups and we've tragically seen this in Italy and Spain and France with a lot of coffins being taken out of care facilities.